water is going to go, which is not that straightforward all the time. Okay. Second thing is you have to collect the water, and if you are using a surfactant or some other liquid, some other uh, uh, some other material along with the water to actually cause the movement to occur, you will have to collect the water because otherwise you, you will have an area which is much bigger in contamination than what it was started with. And the third thing is the soil has to be very permeable, it cannot be clay material and you cannot wait for like you know, six months for the water to show up in a, in a well there. So keep that in mind those are some of the limitations in fact because of those limitations it is not something widely practiced. I will not encourage you to think of soil washing as um, Sorry, sorry, soil flushing as a technology to, to jump on unless you have really good reason why how you think it will first of all it will move, it will move quickly and have the capability to collect. Okay. So if you happen to have those, yeah, you can use it, but it is not something that uh, that, that you would consider first. If you look at there are major soil washing operations that have gone on and, uh, and but not as much as soil flushing. So as a, but having said that you should keep that in your arsenal as, as a technology that can be utilized. So here is a so you can use flushing solutions so water, dilute acids or bases, um, maybe sol solvents be, be very careful with that kind of a thing because you do not want the, the problem to become worse. Okay. Uh, so, so what? Are, let me ask you a question. In, in in medicine, what is the rule that the doctors have to follow? The first rule is don't do no harm. Whatever situation is, don't make it worse. Okay, that's that's the the doctors the oath that they take. This is also the same thing is here as well. Don't do something that will aggravate the situation. Keep that in mind. Whatever I'm planning to do is—is is it, is it going to make the situation worse, or is it going to make the situation better? So, um, the solvents. Be careful. So surfactants you can use. Um, sorption and retardation will control. Um, different species will travel differently. That's the other thing. Now. Um, different species will travel differently. What does that mean? All right, do you okay, let me let me ask a, a housekeeping question. You guys have to go at 1 o'clock. Is there anybody here who has to leave at 1 o'clock? Sorry. 1 30? Because we will go a little bit longer today. We have to. So I'm hoping you have to. If you need to go outside for a minute or two, we can arrange that. But let's go a little bit longer and try to cover as much as we can. Okay. All right. Um, what does this mean? Different species will travel differently. How many of you are doing contaminant transport projects? Ah, now nobody is raising their hand. Only one. You are doing a contaminant transport project or just a ground water flow project? How many of you are doing a contaminant transport project? I can tell at least half a dozen of you have told me I am doing a contaminant transport project. Now I cannot see a single hand up, just raise one hand. Because so. Um, let me explain how what, what I mean by that. So there is a mathematically, so the reason I ask is this, if you do a contaminant transport model, um, you will see mathematically it can be shown that certain species retard as they move down the path. Others because what happens is some of these species will get adsorbed here and then get desorbed and get adsorbed here 
and then get desorbed and get adsorbed here and so on and move. The other species might move straight. Physically that is the phenomenon. Mathematically it can be shown and if, if you have guys have been working, if any of you is working on, on contaminant transport or you will be working on contaminant transport, you can show mathematically that the velocity of, of flow of let us say pyrene is, is lot slower than velocity with which benzene would flow. Same waste water, same water, same everything because benzene is retarded less than let us say pyrene. Okay. And so, so, so different contaminants move at a different speed, different, different speed. The physics behind this whole thing or the explanation, because mathematically it can be shown, but math is, um, but what is the physics behind it? The physics is something like this that let us say you are going from here to Delhi. Okay. You can either take a bus from here to Lucknow, get off Lucknow, then hang the hang around for a few days, then take a bus to Kanpur, then Kanpur to Tundla, then Tundla to um, you know Ghaziabad and, and the other fellow just goes straight, which is faster, right? So that is that's the analogy that, that you have adsorption, desorption, adsorption, desorption for one of them and the other and, 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 and is, is, is straight through. That is a, that's a physical analogy for what happens. Uh, mathematically as which is very clear to understand. So uh, transport mechanisms, advection, dispersion, um, we do not need the, the M here. Um, the contaminant applicability for soil flushing has to be highly soluble and very low interfacial tension uh, because you want the contaminant to be able to come out. If you have salt for example, you flush water, the salt will come out dissolved in the water and go. You don't want something that is sticking to the and you can be unable to take it out because you don't have the ability to to mix it in the soil surface, right? What do we do with the wash water? Wash water is the water that comes out. You have to do you have to do some treatment for it, okay? Um, if you are doing wastewater, if you if your wastewater contains inorganic, you will. Uh, You, you, you can do precipitation, you can do ion exchange, you can also filter the water out. If you have organics, you can do air stripping which is basically pump air from the bottom and the organics if it is dissolved phase will just move on with the air. Uh, carbon adsorption, you can do bio treatment, we talked about bio treatment in the morning. Um, there is something known as an unconventional so soil washing, water flooding and pressure application. Enhanced oil recovery and surfactant applications are again um, some of the unconventional soil washing. So limitations of soil washing, its effectiveness will depend on site conditions. Um, remember this is soil washing, the ex situ version, okay. Hydrophobic contaminants are difficult to remove, something which is stuck, you will need more than just uh, water and maybe surfactants and others as well. Different contaminants may require different wash fluid, that is a problem, you cannot, so it, it might require sequential washing. If you have your soil with a lot of humic materials, uh, natural organic matter, it makes it very difficult and the cost of, of surfactant solvents may be expensive. Limitations of soil flushing require large quantities of wa wastewater. There will be heterogeneities in media, you know you got this subsurface, there is a clay lens, the water will start to go around the clay, never get, you will never get the clay, the stuff is in the clay. If you apply water, add additives to the water, it is always a concern because you need to, you know, what, what is the fate of these additives in, uh, in, in the subsurface and of course the cost of the fractions. Okay, are you, are you clear about? the part here, okay. Okay, so this is, uh, so look at the technologies that we have talked so far. <coughs> we have talked about um, soil vapor extraction, we talked about soil flushing, washing, we will talk about others as well, right. What is the con? amongst at least the numbers that we saw in terms of the, the soil type that can be claimed. 
highly permeable or sandy material, right? See, most technologies will work with sandy material, okay? The problem is when you have clay. Every single one of them you'll run into trouble once you have clay, okay? So, if you have clay material, what you have to do then um, is possibly this one hydraulic or pneumatic fracturing. You fracture the clay to, to make the contaminant accessible. Okay. So, by itself, fracturing is not a remediation technique. Okay. And the purpose of fracturing is to create. Uh, so the purpose is to create fractures, enhance the mass transfer, improve accessibility to the contaminants, and improve applicability of other remediation techniques. Uh, let me see what I have here. I'm going to. So what I'll do here is something somewhat different. I want to see if this thing would work. Then we can come back and talk about these, these slides here, right? Oh. लगे रहना This this one should illustrate to you what uh, flushing, sorry, um, fracking would do. Then we can go back and look at the different technology. Otherwise, it's hard to understand. It's a very small video. Okay, now watch this. I don't think there is sound in this one, but so watch how how it is happening. Okay, this is how, and we'll talk about the different. So they drill a borehole there. You see, there is a there is a cutter going right through to, and this is from the oil and gas industry. So they send it to the to, to whatever is is the layer they want this. They pull it out. Now they'll put this injector here. Now they will blast it. There you go. That's the cement casing. And drill bit goes. Because this is blasting, you see that? And then they pull it out, blast it. This is how they do the extract oil from formations. Okay? They keep continue to blast. Did you get it? You want me to play it again or it's okay? 
so you see that's the now this whole technology we have taken from uh, from the oil and gas industry okay so basically that that in a nutshell is how it happened you, you, you create the borehole you case it and then you put this uh, this uh, thing that, that causes the blast and then you continue to pull it back and you and and if you <coughs> depends on what you want you can either blast air or you can, which is pneumatic or you can blast water which is hydraulic okay if you are blasting water you would you would use sand with it along with a bunch of um, it's basically water sand and a bunch of other, and some chemicals the chemicals are things which they don't they don't want corrosion to occur they don't want um, micro uh, microbial activities so some biocide but the intent is the sand will so if the so sand will keep the the fracture open otherwise as the fluid goes the this the whole thing might co collapse so the sand will act like micro pillars small pillars all over so the, the, the sand will sand and the water goes in the sand gets stuck in the cracks and, and and keeps the pore sizes open for the oil and the gas to flow that's the entire concept of hydraulic fracture fracture you fracture the formation and keep these micro pillars of sand uh, making sure that the fracture sizes remain open and then you can pull out the gas okay so the idea is to create fractures enhance mass transfer of contaminants in oil and gas you might, you, you, you want you, you want the transfer of gas and oil to go through it improve accessibility to the contaminants and improve application so what we do is in our case we want accessibility to the contaminant right so if you have clay material you can use the same concept you can fracture it open it up and then once the the, the size the, the pores are open then you can do bioremediation you can the nutrients down that pipe you can put air down that pipe you can do you know you can even extract if you wish to if there is any vapor to be extracted you have it you have improved the accessibility of the site by fracking open okay where it where does it work it works in silty clay uh, clay silt sandy silt clay sand sandstone siltstone so on so it can be water based or air based okay so in air based we don't use sand air based you just have a big blast of air okay the advantage so what happens is because this of air comes in the air it, it cracks open wherever there is a plane of weakness it will open it up okay once it opens it up the sand grains or whatever is at the at, at the surface will get rubbed off and some of them will dislocate and relocate in different locations and because it it is air crack it's it's a very fine fracture it's not a big opening water require is a bigger opening right because water will not go in in very fine cracks whereas air will so you don't need a sand or something because those things that get dislodged from the from the surface is enough prop it open are you with me on that so that's why that's one of the difference between hydraulic and and pneumatic uh, fracturing so hydraulic fracturing is responsible for making 25 to 30% of oil fields viable um, the fluid is injected under pressure at the bottom of a borehole the fluid consists of a biodegradable liquid and sand so you use a biodegradable liquid because you want the liquid to degrade otherwise that that thing is going to occupy the the space and uh, eventually degrade sand is used as a propent once the fracture is established the liquid degrades and only sand remains in the fracture the pressure imparted by the fluid nucleates a fracture and once the fracture is initiated the required pressure for crack for crack propagation decreases so if you are doing it vertically then the hydraulic fracture so you saw that video was a horizontal pole you can do the same for vertical you go down to the bottom you crack it open take it up crack it open take it up crack it open and then take the whole thing out okay it's identically same 
uh, the vertical so in, when you do vertical spacing you need to make sure it is about half a foot to one foot because otherwise the cracks will start to emerge. Um, cracks may extend up to 25 to 30 feet radi radially at a depth of about 30 feet an average crack. So, the, the diff one of the other difference between hydraulic and pneumatic is the crack thickness the, the thickness of the hole it is about 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 of an inch ok. So, compare that to pneumatic it is even it is much smaller uh, sorry pneumatic is much smaller. Uh, in pneumatic air or gas induced air is injected under pressure uh, pressure has to be greater than in situ stresses of course, uh, most of your engineers you know what, what I am talking in in situ stresses. So, the important design parameter here is air flow injection air flow maximum dimensions uh, reach very quickly the radius of the pneumatic fracture ranges from 10 to 25 feet ok. I am looking at the hydraulic fracture 25 to 30 feet. So, it is a little bit bigger it is self propping. So, no propent is used and the aperture is a lot smaller 0.5 to 1 millimeter ok as compared to 0.2 to 0.4 of an inch ok. And advantages of our hydraulic fracking well you do not have to worry about the fluid breaking down you do not have to worry about the fact that the fluid break down in, in, in as 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 in hydraulic and also it has a higher permeability because think about water if you are applying water it will go into areas which are weak and open it up ok, but it is not going to go into all kinds of secondary area secondary uh, planes of weakness air will will go into all this so you will have a better fractured formation each fracture will be smaller the, the, the pore will be smaller, but you will have a bigger network as compared to water where you will have bigger pores, but, but smaller in number because the water will not make its way through, through some of the other <coughs> excuse me ok. So, the so the process here is 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 as we talked about advance a borehole position the injector at the desired fracture elevation seal off and apply pressure reposition and apply here again pretty straightforward. You still need to do a feasibility evaluation ok because like in any of these technologies that we have been seeing you will have to still do find out how many how many do you need what is the time it will take how many fractures do you need what is the what are you trying to get like fracture depth what extent are you going to all that. Um, you need how you need to have the geology characterization and geotechnical characterization. Um, so, so, how will you know how far the fracture has gone if I have fracture here what will be the radius of influence of a fracture. So, you can you can know by um, so the way they do it is they, they put cameras down this thing and find out how much thickness there is thickness of the thing. You can also measure the ground heave it's a very good uh, you know beard light you know the, the thing that is used for surveying right and you can actually find out because if there is a crack that has opened the ground should heave even if it is a very small the ground should be you, you, can, you can measure by that. So, there are ways or, or you can put a borehole camera and take pictures of the fractures as you uh, as, as you pull the thing out. So, so there are ways of finding out uh, uh, how how, how uh, the, the fractures are and if, and if you have fluids you can see how much fluid you have been able to pump in you know the way you should be able to find out where it goes. So, geology characterization type of soil and rock type of deposition groundwater depth presence of perched water table type and depth of contamination um, geotechnical characterizations that are important that we is Atterberg's limits grain size analysis and confined strength and so on. So, system design economics of fracturing 
location should cover the contaminated area and JEP should cover the full extent of the contamination and the fracture installation can be done in a phased manner. So it's pretty similar. Uh, so once you can, from a, from a remediation perspective, once you crack open the formation, you can use it for bioremediation. You can use it for extracting vapors. If there are vapors in there, you can reuse it for any other purpose that, because you have made the, the, or the, the contamination um, accessible, right? And because it is accessible, you can, uh, whatever technology you want to use, you can use at that point. It's in situ, but it is accessible, okay? Any questions on this one? Okay. Okay, before I get on with this, um, I want to talk about tomorrow's exam. Let me talk about the exam. Okay. 